Welcome everybody. You're here today for a wonderful program and the uh, title of the presentation is Martin Luther King and the American Dream Today. My name is Joan Jacobs. I live here in Portsmouth and I and my husband Larry Drake have been very busy bees the last week or two as volunteer coordinators for the author Hedrick Smith for his Seacoast swing for his book tour in New Hampshire. So we're really very pleased that he's here with us, especially in Portsmouth. I also want to thank uh, River Run Bookstore for being here with books. Uh, for those of you that uh, uh, want to buy one on your way out or your way in, and there will be an opportunity for books to be signed. The topic of today's presentation, the timing and the location, are indeed magical. We are here in this fabulous church building that has been in existence, I believe, since the mid-1800s, around 1851. And from the beginning of last century and for 50 years, it was the home, the spiritual home and the community home of the African American community in Portsmouth. That tradition continues with the Black Heritage Trail, and we're very thankful to Valerie Cunningham and everyone else in Portsmouth and across the state that are committed to that wonderful project. This is site number 19 on the Black Heritage Trail. If you don't know, this is a location where the Reverend Martin Luther King spoke. He was a guest preacher here in 1952, while he was a, a divinity student at Boston University. So for me, these are really magical, magical uh, uh, space to be in. Now today we have Hedrick Smith, who is a renowned journalist. He's a correspondent. He's producer of many moving and riveting documentary films. I could, wouldn't begin to list all his honors, but he did uh, win an Emmy for his work and a Pulitzer Prize and a Neiman Fellowship, I believe. So we're really lucky to have him here today. As a young reporter, Hedrick Smith covered the Civil Rights Movement. He was witness to the struggles of Martin Luther King and his lieutenants in the Southern Christian Leadership, Leadership Conference. He witnessed their bravery in bringing down Jim Crow and making America a better place for all of us. I got to know Hedrick Smith, know him, watching PBS, like a good college educated girl. And not only did I learn a lot about the world, especially in his coverage of international relations, Russia and domestic politics, I, got, I learned a lot, but I also came to recognize what comprises really quality journalism. Not the, you know, some say kind of journalism that you hear on certain outlets these days. So I think that was part of my education. His work spans 50 years, and his work is eclectic. His work goes from Duke Ellington to Mikhail Gorbachev, from the Pentagon Papers to youth violence. His body of work sets a standard exceptional in American journalism and public discourse. I've read the book and I recommend it highly. I'll just take a quote from Random House in their, I guess their publication information or the publicity information. And they said, this author fits together the pieces of the big puzzle in a way that only a veteran reporter can. He shows how recent news stories from the mortgage mess to teetering banks, disappearing pensions, assaults against unions, and the gradual stripping away of middle class power and prosperity, how these are all a product of a step-by-step -step political and economic dismantling that began in 1971 and that continues today. So hang in everybody, we're in for a thrilling and enlightening ride. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Hedrick Smith.
well, thank you all for being here and coming on a holiday uh, and sharing part of that holiday with me. And let me thank my new friends, Larry Drake and Joan Jacobs. Uh, these two are dynamos. You already know that from living in this town. I didn't know it. Um, some weeks ago, a suggestion was made that I come up here. And I got to tell you, they have got me moving around this area. <laughs> Beautiful. I mean, I couldn't have asked for any more. Uh, you know them. I just want to take my hats off to them and thank them. Okay. Portsmouth, um, as you can expect, having spent some time with the New York Times, I did have occasion to come to New Hampshire uh, <laughs> over the years. Uh, but I have a special reason for being in New Hampshire uh, and being nearby. Uh, I have a daughter and uh, her husband and a grandson who live in Exeter, not very far from here. So uh, this is home territory for me. I was over with, Larry took me over today to Southern New Hampshire University. My daughter graduated from Southern New Hampshire University when it was still called New Hampshire College. And then she went on and got an MBA at UNH. So we got the New Hampshire connection here. So I feel, I feel I'm here with the home folks. Um, now, uh, people have asked me over this span of, uh, I hate to admit it's 50 years, but it is, uh, of reporting about the uh, significant people that I've covered. Uh, and I t think about historically significant people as people who in my, um, my terms, bent the path of history. There are lots of people who go on and they do good jobs and they can do good jobs in corporations or they can do jobs in, in, in good jobs in, in journalism or in teaching uh, or in politics or whatever. But essentially, they're varying things, but they continue policies and the direction of history that there was before. But there are several people whom I've met in my lifetime who've actually changed the course of history. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of coming. One of them was Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt. I was a correspondent for the New York Times in Cairo. Uh, and Sadat's decision to open peace talks with the Israelis really changed the geography and the history of the Middle East. Sadly, it hasn't led to an ultimate peace, but it did change the course of history there. Uh, when I was in Russia, uh, back in the 1970s, I met Andre and covered him, knew him well. Andrei Sakharov, the brilliant uh, Soviet physicist who became a fighter for peace and justice and human rights in the Soviet Union. And he did have a significant impact uh, on that country. And then years later, I went back to that country uh, and I covered Perestroika and Gorbachev. And there's no question that Gorbachev had an enormous impact on history and the history of the world, certainly the history of East-West relations in the latter part of the 20th century. But in the early part of my career, I was fortunate enough to cover Martin Luther King. Um, I actually began my civil rights coverage in Nashville, Tennessee, covering John Lewis, who was one of my heroes. Uh, at that point, a man, um, 19 years old, wearing his Sunday best suit as he marched down to town, two by two, with other uh, black students from, from uh, uh, from Fisk University and Tennessee State University and a few from Vanderbilt University to try to desegregate the lunch counter. Um, we have this picture of Martin Luther King. We do this with leaders. We remember leaders as sort of at their pinnacle, at their peak, when they've achieved uh, greatness and, and they have a platform where the world can see them. And so our picture of Martin Luther King, and I suspect I have been running around today not listening to the radio, but I've done this in years past, listen to the radio, and what you hear about Martin Luther King, you should hear about Martin Luther King, which is excerpts from that great speech that he made on August 28, uh, 1963, uh, and the March on Washington, when he was talking about, I have a dream, a dream one day that America will live up to its promises, a dream that one day my children will be uh, respected and honored, uh, not uh, judged not by the color of their skin, but by their character, of, of their personal character. Um, and, and that, I mean, that was a magnificent moment. Uh, it was, I, to me, it was one of the great days of my life as a reporter and as an individual. There was, I call it a festival of democracy. There was a festive air. This is a movement of protest, right? And it was a movement of protest against Jim Crow for good reason. But it was also a moment of sort of celebration, of achievement. Uh, these were people who had not come to Washington. These are people for whom Washington was a distant place and power was a distant thing. And here they were. I remember I was up early that morning 
uh, looking out over the mall, the green swath of grass uh, stretching towards the Washington Monument. The uh, sun came up and there was a sort of a pink dawn and then it turned orange. And the, and the trailways and the Greyhound buses started rolling in. They rolled in from, from New England, they rolled in from the Middle West, they rolled in from New York. And then the Freedom Riders and, and the uh, protesters, the lunch counter protesters, and the students who'd been down in the South began arriving by car and by train. So when they gathered all around, and, and, they, and they arrived early. Uh, and some brought picnics, and they picnicked on the mall you know, before the celebrations, and there were a lot of speakers, and it went on a long time. <laughs> there was a lot of singing, and it was, it was wonderful. But it was this festive moment of, of, here we are, this is our country, this is our capital, this is our power, this is where we belong to be. Uh, and that was, a, I, I thought, almost as important as the, as the rhetoric of the day was that sense of achievement. Now, it wasn't the end of the Civil Rights Movement. I mean, they had to go on pushing, uh, but it was important that within a year, uh, the Civil Rights Act desegregating public facilities was passed by Congress and a year later after the bloody march in Selma, Alabama, which John Lewis was literally clubbed unconscious, uh, we passed, uh, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. Um, but that picture of Martin Luther King at his prime, uh, the voice of the people preaching in the bully pulpit of American democracy at one of the great temples of American democracy, the Lincoln Memorial, is a picture that is appropriate, but it isn't the whole Martin Luther King. The first time uh, Martin Luther King was a, was a practical, demanding, as well as inspiring leader. He was not just an icon and an inspiration. He should today not just be a memory, but a model. He was an activist. And when I first met him, he was sitting on the ground. He was on the ground with about 20 other protesters in front of the city hall in Albany, Georgia. And they were protesting the, the segregated regulations and laws uh, of Georgia and of the city of Albany. And the fact that there were colored and white drinking fountains and colored and white restrooms and colored and white uh, lunch counters and so forth. And they were, they were trying to break those barriers down. And sure enough, he got arrested and carted away. And then he paid his bail and got out and continued to protest. You know? and then I, saw him at another campaign in, in that great city, Birmingham, which we called at that time Bombingham, we were called, Bombingham, Alabama, uh, because of the bombings there. Um, and um, Martin Luther King was leading, the, was leading the, the movement, but he didn't go out and demonstrate all the time. He sort of saved himself for particular moments, and there was a moment, I think in May of 1963, several, several months before the March on Washington, when um, People in the movement were worried that the demonstrations in the movement was losing momentum, uh, and uh, and maybe it was time for King to march. And a couple were urging him to, and others were saying, "No, don't do that." Uh, and uh, King had had a, a, a very unpleasant experience when he was arrested in Georgia. And at one point, he thought that uh, that he was going to be killed when he was in the custody of, of some sheriffs in Georgia, uh, being transported across the state in a police car with one of those iron grates and a police dog in the back seat with him. Um, and so he was a little reluctant to get into jail and put himself in the hands of sort of brutal people uh, unless it was absolutely necessary. And he went back in the back room of his motel and he called his wife, Coretta King. This is my story comes from Andy Young, who was one of his close lieutenants. And he came back out wearing his coveralls and that meant that he was ready to go to work and he was going to go march. And he marched and he uh, was arrested just as he expected and he went into the Birmingham jail. And you may recall this document, but from the Birmingham jail at that point, he wrote what is now known as the letter from the Birmingham jail from uh, Martin Luther King. And what he was doing was basically saying to moderates and fence sitters in the South, you are perpetuating Jim Crow. You are perpetuating uh, segregation. You are perpetuating an evil system because you're sitting on the fence and you're not declaring yourself. So what was going on was there were the big mules in Birmingham, the powers that be, and they were resisting desegregation, uh, and then there were the protesters, and there were a lot of people in between who sort of disapproved segregation, but they didn't do anything about it. And so he was trying to get the fence sitters uh, off the fence. And, and uh, he was largely successful with his rhetoric, but it's interesting um, how Segregationists always hurt themselves, uh, or did in that era. Uh, not too long after that letter, I remember one night sitting down after a day's reporting in Birmingham with a couple of other reporters to have dinner. 
Saturday night in a nice restaurant in Birmingham. We'd just barely gotten our entrees to us. I think we'd had our salad, but we had just about to dig into, I don't know, the steak or the chicken or the fish or whatever it was, and somebody came running in and, and said, there's a riot going on in one of the parks in Birmingham. What had happened was there'd been a bombing at the Gaston Motel where Martin Luther King had been staying. Actually, fortunately, he was away for the weekend. It was a Saturday night. He was going back to Atlanta, so he wasn't there. But a huge gaping hole had been blown in that, in that motel. And his brother, who actually lived in Birmingham, was a minister in Birmingham, M.D. King, his home had actually been bombed, and he had not been harmed. But there had been a couple of bombings, and there was rioting that went on all night long. And the next morning, Kennedy called out the troops. And it's interesting, that combination of the appeal to the moderates the explosion of segregationist violence turned the tide, and in fact, there was a negotiation that got underway in Birmingham, and you got the desegregation of the facilities. My point simply is that, that, that King was a man of action. He was not just a great preacher. It was not just words. It was action. There were times when he thought it was important to put his body on the line. Now, the title of my talk is Martin Luther King and the American Dream Today, and I'm going to come back to the issue of putting our bodies on the line. Because I think that's something we need to get back to. We need to think about that. If we're unhappy with the state of America today, and as I read the polls and as I talk to people, I think lots of people, a great majority of people, of all political stripes and of all levels of economic earning, including the top 1%, I've talked audiences in the top 1%, as well as others uh, at the very other end. Um, and I think people are deeply disturbed about where America is today. But let me go on for a moment about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was denounced in the South in that period, uh, not just as an activist, but as an agitator. And one of the epithets that segregationists like to throw at demonstrators was they're outside agitators. So Martin Luther King from, came from Atlanta, Georgia, and he showed up in Birmingham, he was an outside agitator. Not a communist, although, by the way, J. Edgar Hoover thought he was a communist, and they bugged his phone. They did all kinds of things to Martin Luther King that, um, well, hopefully the NSA is not doing this today, but no, no, agency, no agency has any right to do to anybody uh, without cause. Um, and they called him an agitator, and he turned around and he said to him, yes, I am an agitator. I am an agitator. I'm an agent for change and I'm agitating for change. And if you think about it, and you look at your washing machine, where you wash your clothes, down in the center of your washing machine, there is an agitator. And it is shaking your clothes in the water to shake the dirt out of your water. Out of your clothes, excuse me. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to shake the dirt out of this society. I'm here to shake the evil system of Jim Crow and segregation. So yes, I'm an agitator, and I'm proud to be an agitator. Uh, I may be a bit of an agitator, too. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, this was an era of agitation. Think about it. We tend to focus on Martin Luther King because he's this clearly identifiable, um, unassailably eloquent individual. There was a woman's movement at that time. Better for Dan and all her friends, they were agitators too. They said, it's not right, it's not fair. Women are making 41 cents on the dollar for doing the same work that men are doing. And there are all kinds of other things. There are glass ceilings, there are, there, are, there, are, there are careers we can't get into. Today, half the kids in law school, half the kids in medical school are women. That wasn't the case back then. I'm about to go speak tomorrow at, at uh, Exeter Academy. It was a time when there weren't any women on the faculty at Exeter. It was a time when there weren't any women in the school. I went to a school that was all male. Okay? So that was that era. People said it was wrong. They agitated. They agitated for change. There was a consumerist movement at that time. Ralph Nader wrote that book, Unsafe at Any Speed. What was the complaint? The complaint was American automobile makers were making cars that were mechanically defective mechanically defective, they had brakes that failed, steering mechanisms that failed, caused accidents, people were being killed. This was an outrage. And Nader wrote about it. By the way, GM dogged him, they tried to plant a woman on him, they put undercover agents on him, and he eventually sued General Motors, and they had to pay up and he used the money to fight General Motors. <laughs> so there was a consumer's movement. 
not just about General Motors, but about the packaging of, of, of consumer goods, about the honesty and the safety of drugs and of food, uh, about, about the, the labeling, honest labeling. If you go look today in a, in a grocery store or a drugstore at some item that you're thinking about buying and you turn it over on the back and you look at the content to see whether or not it's something you want to buy, whether or not it's healthy, you want to put it on your face, you want to feed it to yourself and to your family, you can thank those people back in the 60s and the 70s who were part of that consumerist movement. They demonstrated and demanded that there be regulations. The Pure Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, is a much more potent agency in the wake of the consumerist movement back in the 1970s than it was before. There was a strong labor movement. People in New Hampshire, well, the labor movement, that sounds a little intense. What are we going to say about, well, I don't know how you feel about weekends, but you may like weekends. You can thank the labor movement for the five-day week. You know, you know, I mean, you Child labor laws are sensible, you can thank the labor movement. If you think overtime after 40 hours a week is sensible, you can thank the labor movement. There are other labor movements done things that are wrong. Don't misunderstand me. But they were an important underpinning of middle class prosperity back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. The bargain is actually called the Treaty of Detroit, the 1948 labor agreement between General Motors and the United Auto Workers Union became a model for the American economy. Not just the auto industry. Steel industry, atomic industry, electronics industry, rubber industry, all through, and all kinds of non-union plants. And what did they do? They had agreements which said that you had slightly rising pay during the life of the contract, say five years. You got a health benefit, you got a lifetime pension, you got a defined benefit. It's called defined benefit and defined contribution. Confused, was it defined benefit? Was it, defined? it was a lifetime pension, which meant that your employer paid you a monthly check from the day you retired till the day you died. In 1980, which is not that long ago, 84% of the workers in every company in America that had more than 100 employees, union or not, got a lifetime pension. Today the number is 30%. 70% of the employees in those same companies had fully paid employer health insurance. Today the figure is 18% and falling. Okay. So that was the underpinning of a lot of middle class, not only prosperity, but financial security. And that was won by middle class agitation, if you will, to use the, the term that Martin Luther King, middle class action, people power. There was an environmental movement. You all regard the environment here in New Hampshire as a precious part of your heritage. The green, beautiful outdoors. I mean, to me, I'm a winter guy. I like it. I went to Williams College. I was a correspondent in Moscow. I like to ski. I like to play ice hockey. So being up here, it's absolutely beautiful. I've come from, from dull, drab Washington, D.C., and seeing the snow is exciting and fun. But you, you know, you admire and you protect that nature. The environmental movement was an expression of that urge and that desire, and it was an expression of protest, not about Jim Crow and, and segregation, what about pollution? It was in our faces. The Cuyahoga River was exploding into flames, literally, because there were so many chemicals being dumped into it. The, the Pot Potomac River in Washington was covered with algae, green slime. Put your arm in the river and it came out covered with green slime because of the phosphorus and nitrogen pollution. The air over, uh, over Los Angeles was so bad, literally, asthma patients were literally dying from the smog, from the pollution, from the particles in the environment. So, and on Earth Day, Earth Day, April 1970, April 22nd, probably people here, maybe you all were there. 20 million Americans, 20 million Americans were in the streets, agitating, like Martin Luther King, agitating to clean up the place, exactly like the washing machine, let's clean up the environment, right? So we had that as an anchor of our society, as, as a central part of the dynamics of our politics and our economics. We took it for granted. We believed we had the power. We had the confidence to believe that if we as people, average people, middle class people, spoke out and acted together in our common interest, we could have an impact on the welfare of this society. We believed we had it, we exercised it, and it happened. 
I remember asking Bill Ruckelshaus, the head of the EPA, first head of the EPA, which, by the way, the Environmental Protection Agency was established by executive order before it was uh, enacted into law. It was established by executive order by Richard Nixon, the Republican president in that era. So I asked, I asked Ruckelshaus, I said, was Nixon a closet environmentalist and the rest of us just going to get it? He said, Rick, i got to tell you. He said, in all the years I worked for Nixon, he never once asked me, is it really bad out there, Bill? Is it really true this slime is on the Potomac River or the smog is bad? And he said, never asked about it. He said, the one thing I remember he said to me was, Bill, when you get over there to that agency, he said, don't let the bureaucrats at EPA capture you. EPA. <laughs> Richard Nixon was the only person in Washington, D.C. who thought the nickname for the agency that he established, the EPA, was EPA. <laughs> I, so I said to the Ruckels, well, if that's how Nixon felt, why the heck did he sign all that legislation? Because in the, in the year after that Earth Day of 1970, Congress passed six major pieces of environmental legislation, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Anti-Toxic Substance Act, on and on and on. Guess what Ruckels House said? He said, oh, he said, the people demanded it. We as the government had to respond. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. <laughs> yes? <laughs> I mean, it almost, can you believe we're laughing at that? I mean, it's sort of pathetic. But it is laughable where we are today. I mean, Nixon was practical. Now, Nixon was worried. He was facing the 1972 elections. And at the time this legislation was passed, Ed Muskie of Maine was the leading, presumed, uh, nominee of the Democratic Party. You know, he made the mistake of crying in the snow up here in New Hampshire, and of course that killed him. But the point was Nixon was afraid he was going to be outflanked, and, and practical politics said he had to do it. But practical politics was based on middle-class agitation. I'm back to that word of Martin Luther King. That's why it was a potential threat that Nixon had to deal with. Now, it was interesting to me, and, and I've come back at this sort of backwards in, the, in, in my way of thinking. As I was doing the research on this book, I was trying to understand where we were uh, in 2009 when I started to work on this book, and then how we got to where we were. And that took me back to this era of middle-class, what I call people power, middle-class power. And there's no question in my mind, after I looked at it for some time, and I spent about a year researching and reporting before I wrote a single word, that the, the power of the middle class through these movements and its influence on the instruments of government and the institutions of government was a very important underpinning to the middle class prosperity, to the widely shared prosperity in that era. I mean, if you look at the, the, the tax laws of that time, if you look at environmental laws, certainly if you look at the wage laws, you look at the minimum wage laws, if you look at the bipartisan coalitions there were on all kinds of things that happened during that era, they stemmed from and were based on and were in response to this pressure from the middle class to increase the public welfare. So that was a major factor. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking, you know, I remember it coming out of Williams College in 1955, pretty quiet time, but into the 60s and so on. I remember that as a time of pretty widely shared prosperity. And I thought to myself, well, you're a reporter, Smith. Um, you better go back and check. I mean, you know, you're gray-haired, you're white-haired now. And people who are white-haired have a tendency to sort of say, well, you know, back in the old days when I was growing up, I mean, things were really good back then. Right? And so I thought, I better go back and, you know, everybody was above average. It's the late Wobegon, so to say. <laughs> and uh, so, so I went back and I looked, and sure enough, it was true. It was true. From World War II, 1945, and to the mid-70s, the productivity of the American workforce, the driving engine of growth, roughly doubled. It increased 97%. And the median household income, the income of the families right in the dead middle of the American economy rose 95%. Dollar for dollar, almost directly, the gains of the economy, the profits of the corporations, the growth of the American economic machine translated and were passed on through to the people in the very middle of the economy. And economists call that 
the great convergence. What they mean by that is there certainly wasn't the equality of income. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. Charlie Wilson, the CEO of General Motors, made 40 times uh, what, the, uh, what the average worker made, although you'd be interested to know. Charlie Wilson's salary was about $600,000 a year. Well, adjusted for inflation, that would be about $5 million today. Well, you know, $5 million for a CEO today? I mean, that's sort of Piper's pay. I mean, you know, what do they do, run 7-Elevens? <laughs> any any, any self-respecting any self CEO today is making less than 50, 60 million is really kind of, you know, He's missing it, and his board of directors is not treating him very well. It tells you something about what's happened to the inflation of certain people's pay in this country in the last 30 or 40 years. So, the great convergence, when the economists took a look at it, they found out, they like to break us up into quintiles, the top 20%, second 20%, all the way down to the bottom 20%. If you look at that period from 1945 through the late 70s, all five quintiles moved up in terms of their median income in each group. They all moved up together. In fact, the ones at the bottom, the bottom two quintiles moved up a little faster than the ones in the middle, and the ones at the top moved up a little slower. So they actually converged a little bit. But there still was significant inequality of income. So my question was, how did that happen? Well, one factor I've told you is middle class power. Middle class, the exercise of middle class power, the agitation on a number of issues had, had an impact. But there was something else, and that something else is very important. We had business leaders in that time who believed that it was good business and smart economics to pay their workforce well to deliver the benefits I just told you about, 84% with lifetime pensions, 70% with fully paid employer uh, health benefits. They thought that was smart. And economists look at it and they say, actually, it was smart. It was what they call the virtuous circle of growth. If lots of employers pay tens of millions of employees very big salaries, American middle class people spend their money. They don't, we don't save a lot. Japanese save a lot. We don't save a lot. We spend it. I spend about 95% of the money, and in bad times, American middle class people, families spend 100% or 102% or 105%. But in good times, they spend 95%. Best saving rate we have is somewhere between 4 to 5%. Now, what that is, that's the engine of growth. It is consumption from tens of millions, from 150 million middle class Americans, 180 million middle class Americans, that actually drives our economy. If you want to know about the job creators in the American economy, they're sitting in this room. You are the job creators. We are the job creators. The job creators are not the people at the top. We do need capital, but we have not been short of capital for a number of years. American business has been sitting on $2 trillion or more earned cash sitting in its coffers, waiting for enough consumer demand to justify the expansion of their production. And it's starting to happen, and we're starting to see some growth. So shortage of capital hasn't been the problem. It is shortage of consumer demand. And that has to do with the middle class not being paid enough. But back in the old days, and literally a century ago, in 1914, Henry Ford actually said this. And a lot of other things Henry Ford said that we might not necessarily be terribly proud of. So I, I don't want to extol Henry Ford too much. This is a man who knows Henry Ford. But Henry Ford said at one point when he instituted the $5 a day, which was an unheard of sum at that point, that it not only is necessary for me to do that, and it's good business for me to do that, and it's fair, but it's smart for my company. Because if my workers are paid well, they can afford to buy the Model T cars that Ford Motor Company makes. And if you move forward to Charlie Wilson in the 1950s, or Ray Jones at GE, General Electric, or Frank Abrams at Standard Oil of New Jersey, now Exxon Mobil, they all believed this. They articulated this. They thought it was the sacred duty. They even used terms like that. Sacred trust of the CEO to balance the interests of the various stakeholders in the corporation. They practiced what is called stakeholder capitalism. And what they meant by that is to balance the interests of all the groups that have a stake in the success of the corporation. Of course, that means the owners, but it means the managers. It means the rank and file employees, white collar, blue collar, pink collar, whatever collar. It means the customers. It means the creditors, it means the suppliers, it means a whole slew of economic interests. They thought it was their job to balance these interests. And so they shared the wealth. And the country benefited from that, that strategy and that philosophy. 
in a period of tremendous growth and rising living standards for tens of millions of American families. So the question is, what happened? What happened to that? I'm back to American dream with Martin Luther King. What happened? Well, a couple of things happened. Number one, there was a tremendous power shift. The very powers that I was talking about, middle class powers, the consumers movement, women's movement, labor movement, environmental movement, civil rights movement, did the Newtonian thing. They created an equal and opposite reaction. The bosses, believe it or not, the bosses revolted. There was a revolt from above. Uh, a guy named Lewis Powell, whose name you may know since he was appointed to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon in 1972, um, was actually a very big corporate attorney with a lot of good friends at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And he was disturbed at, at the power that he saw in these middle class movements, and so were some of them. And he got talking with them one day at the Chamber of Commerce, and he was talking about it, and they said, why don't you go write it down? You're a lawyer, you know how to make an argument, you know how to, uh, how to prepare a brief. Prepare a brief. He wrote what is now known historically as the Lewis Powell Memorandum of August 1971. And in it he said to American business leaders, and his memo was secretly circulated among business leaders by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, he said that you are the forgotten people in Washington. Business is forgotten, and you're getting killed in the political arena. You're doing a good job running your businesses, but you're getting killed politically. You need to organize, you need to pool your money. Does this sound familiar? You need to organize, you need to pool your money, you need to identify your political enemies, you need to go after them vigorously, and he uses very strong language. He says the American free enterprise system is under mortal threat. Now, you would have thought that Ralph Nader was a bigger threat to the American system than Soviet communism if you read Lewis Powell. And by the way, the text of his memo is in my book. You can actually read it for yourselves. Uh, I think it is the most important, basically unknown or unheeded document in the last 50 years of our history. Uh, what, it had an electric effect. What's astonishing is that it fell on such fertile ground that at the time Powell wrote, there were about 175 companies, only 175 companies, that had offices in Washington. Within eight years, before Ronald Reagan was elected, there were 2,425. There were 50,000 people working for business trade associations. There were 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists, and there were 8,000 corporate PR people. There was an army. I call it Powell's Army. And that army began to go to work, and it's interesting, began to go to work when the Democrats were in control of Congress, both houses, and Jimmy Carter was in the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, one discovery for me in writing this book, reporting this book, was the most pivotal Congress of the last 50 years was the Congress of 1978. That is when the 401k was written into law. That is when the corporate bankruptcy laws were changed in ways that helped corporations that, 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 that basically ripped up their labor contracts and did all kinds of things in the steel industry in the 1990s, the aircraft industry, airline industry uh, in the 2000s. Um, it wrote a law that overrode state usury laws that put limits on interest rates and allowed no interest on limits rates, which actually set up the subprime. It was absolutely necessary to setting up the subprime crisis of the late 1990s and the 2000s. Um, it, was a, it was a legislature where labor and the environmental and the consumer movement thought they were going to get all kinds of laws on their behalf, easier organizing for labor, Consumer Protection Bureau for Ralph Nader and company. None of those things ever got out of Congress. They got bottled up. And most importantly, tax legislation. If you ever want to know what the political rhythm, climate, uh, and prevailing forces are in Washington, always watch tax law. Jimmy Carter proposed taking, closing some of the loopholes for the wealthy, dropping some of the poor people off the tax rolls, and raising the corporate tax rate 2%. When that bill came back from Congress, there were no loopholes closed, there were no uh, poor people dropped off the tax rolls, the corporate tax rate was not only not raised 2%, it was lowered 2%. Not a big change, but the change in direction was absolutely vital. And the capital gains tax was dropped 20 points from 48% to 28%. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a game-changing moment. One of those moments you may have been waiting for in yesterday's game with the Broncos. <laughs> but you know, in tennis, in sports, in football, various things, there's a moment when the game changes and you can sense that the tide is starting to run in the other direction. That is what 
the, the 1978 Congress was. And I can tell you, I was running the Washington Bureau of the New York Times at that time, and we saw the votes on these pieces of legislation, but we had no idea that what was doing it was Powell's army. We had no idea that there had been a revolt of the bosses. And for the last 30 or 40 years, we've had the same thing go on. Uh, the, the highest the marginal tax rate on Eisenhower was 92%. 92% on the top bracket. On the Kennedy, 77%. Whoa, drops down on the Reagan to 35%, bounces around, now it's in 35, 39% range, okay? But the payroll tax, which all workers pay, it went from 3.5% up to 7.65%. So the people at the bottom and the middle have seen their tax burden rise, while the people at the very top have seen their tax burden fall. The estate tax has come down from, uh, there were there low limits, so you hit the estate tax much earlier in the estate tax, at about a million dollars in the estate, and the tax rate was about 55%. Today, you don't hit the estate tax rate unless your estate is $5 million, and the tax rate is 35%. So that's come down, but the minimum wage is now in America 25% below what it was adjusted for inflation in 1968. So the policies that would benefit the people at the bottom of the economy or in the middle of the economy have lagged, and the policies that would benefit the people at the very top have, have benefited them enormously. The Reagan tax cuts have probably been worth a trillion dollars per decade to the top 1%. We've had them for three decades. The George W. Bush tax cuts of the 2000s were worth another trillion dollars. So we added, with those tax laws, we added about four trillion dollars to the wealth of the people at the top. The top 1% of Americans today have an income of about 1.4 trillion dollars, which is larger than the national income of Canada or of Sweden or of France, okay? In the last 30, five years roughly. We've seen the income, what I call wedge economics, we've seen wedge economics at work. If you look at the rise in productivity compared to the median household income, productivity in the last 30 years has gone up 80%, the median household income has gone up 10%. 80 and 10, remember before it's 95 and 97, real close correlation, now big gap. And the main reason it went up 10% is there are more women working for higher pay. The median male hourly compensation, pay and benefits, in 2011, the Census Bureau told us, is exactly the same as in 1978. Zero gain. Now, you can say, adjusted for inflation, well, that means that pay kept up with inflation. That's true for food and clothing, gasoline, and most expenditures. But the big ticket items that break families and send them into debt skyrocketed way faster than inflation. Healthcare has risen much faster. The cost of homes has risen much faster and the cost of college education. So if you were a middle class family in 2011, 12, 13, 14, and you tried to do for your family what your predecessors did in 1978, you had to go into debt. Couldn't help it. You couldn't balance the books on pay that was the same adjusted for inflation as 30 years ago and meet these higher expenditures. So that's what's going on in the middle. What's going on at the top, I already told you. You know, the CEO of, of major corporations, they're now making close to 300 times as much as the average worker. CEO pay has gone up over this period of time about 350%. The income of the people in the top 1% has gone up about 600%. So you have people in the middle dead even. The people up here are up this much, and the people up there are up that much. From 1979, listen to this number, from 1979 to 2011, 84%, interesting, that number keeps coming up, 84% of the entire growth in the monetary income of this whole country went to the top 1%. 84% of all the gains in those 33 years went to the top 1%. In, and, and in the last decade, from 2000 to 2012, the incomes of the bottom 90% of the people in this country, 270 million people, went down on average 10%. And the income of the top 0.1% went up 72%.
So we have, I mean, we are two Americas today. We're divided by money, we're divided by power. That money is going into politics, you know it. You can see it. People feel it all over the country. It's going into, into politics in ways we can't even trace, we can't even follow. You know, the, the, the campaign finance laws that we've had have been changed radically by court decisions. Citizens United is the most striking, but it's not the only one. There no longer limitations, there used to be limitations on, on uh, how much could be spent in senatorial campaigns and congressional district campaigns and so forth. Those have all been blown away because money is free speech and so uh, free speech is unlimited and therefore those can be uh, unlimited in terms of the expenditure. I know, because I used to live in, in South Carolina, I know Fritz Hollings, former senator of South Carolina fairly well. He told me that when he first started running in 1976, it cost, you couldn't spend more than $700,000. That was the legal limit for a senatorial race in, in South Carolina. When he last ran in the 1990s, there was no legal limit and it cost, in his estimate, $8.5 million. Now, what that means, listen to what that means, because it's really very important. It isn't just the money. It is the cost in human time and effort. Hollings told me that he had to raise $30,000 a week, every week for the entire six years he was in the Senate. Today, if you talk to people on Capitol Hill and they're honest with you, they spend 40 to 50% of their time every day raising money. They're on, they dial for dollars. They, they go down to the Democratic National Committee headquarters or Republican Campaign Committee headquarters, whatever it is, and they're on the phone. They're not doing the people's business. This is an extraordinary distortion of the priorities of our governmental system. This isn't just, this isn't just lopsided because rich people have so much more power because money is power. It's that the representatives we have cannot afford not to do that if they want to stay in the game. And you can ask why they want to stay in the game and we can have another evening on that. So, but, but, so understand what the distortion is. It's a terrible distortion. Now, another distortion we have, and you actually have it right here in, in New Hampshire, and that's the distortion handed to us by Eldridge Gary the governor of Massachusetts in 1812, who began the practice that is now known as gerrymandering, which is drawing the lines of the districts or your state legislative districts or your congressional districts to the advantage of your party. Now, the parties have gotten so good at it, and the software that you can use on computers is so good at it, they can figure out exactly which house and which block should be in which district in order to extract, to squeeze the maximum advantage out of the system. And the result is that today, January 20th, 2014, a smart political reporter in Washington can predict for you the party outcome of the House elections in 90% of the districts next November. Now what that means is 90% of the districts in the House of Representatives are non-competitive. I thought America was about competition. I thought democracy was about competition. Those are locked seats. That's the system we've developed through gerrymandering. I'm talking about money, and I'm talking about gerrymandering. These two things reinforce each other, and they're absolutely destroying our democracy. Uh, in very fundamental ways. Um, the, 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 the districts are so gerrymandered that in, in 2012, across the country, more people voted for Democratic candidates for the House than voted for Republicans. But the Republicans wound up with a 33-vote majority. In Pennsylvania, more people voted for Democrats than Republicans. And there are 18 seats in Pennsylvania. The, the Democratic victory was narrow. So maybe it would have come out 9-9, right? Or maybe 10-8? Or 11-7? No, it came out 13-5. to The German was so effective that the Republicans got 13 seats and the Democrats got five, even though the vote went the other way. But even if it had been even, and it isn't just the Republicans that are doing it, you go right down to Massachusetts, 
And Connecticut, two great states, right? Oh, good New England states. Well, they have 15 seats in the House of uh, Representatives. The vote in those two states is consistently about two-thirds Democrat and about one-third Republican. So the Democrats ought to get 10 seats and the Republicans ought to get five seats. Guess how that one goes? 15 zip, right? 15 to zero. So both parties are doing it. I used to live in Maryland. Maryland's run by the Democrats. Illinois run by the Democrats. Florida, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan run by the Republicans. It's terrible. And it not only, it undermines the integrity of our elections, but it also drives people who are in the middle out of the political game. As those districts get more and more safe, people get turned off by politics, and the people who turn out to vote are people who are passionately dedicated and, and often passionately extreme on one side or another. And the people who run the campaigns play to that extremism. How do you mobilize your base? You get them angry at the other people. You don't talk about politics. You don't talk about sensible policy. You figure out how to get them as angry as you can at the other side, because that gets your people out. They put the money up, and they get out, and they vote. So what happens? You get, you get extreme elected on both sides. More, in my opinion, on the Republican districts, because they've been better at it. And they, in 2010, they controlled more of the state governments across the country, so they had more opportunity. But the Democrats, if they'd been in charge, would have done the same thing. But what happens is when they get to Washington, there's a Grand Canyon between the two parties. There's a chasm. They can't even talk to each other. When I first went to Washington as a reporter, you know, members of Congress used to play basketball together. They had softball games together. I remember talking to Hollings, I talked to Birch by They would go have di dinner. Half a dozen Democratic senators, half a dozen Republican senators had regular dinners at each other's homes. They organized it. They don't do that anymore. They live on different planets. This is not a healthy way to run a democracy. We have a system designed by our founders which requires compromise. You can't have a bicameral legislature in a separate executive branch and get anything done unless people can work together. Yeah, they can disagree, but at some point they have to sit down and do something. I mean, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon and, and sat on the opposite ends of the, of the political spectrum at that time. But we got budgets passed every year. We got civil rights laws. You got Medicare. We got Medicaid. Uh, we, got, we shot people to the moon. We beat the Soviets in, in the Cold War. And we did all kinds of things because bipartisanship worked, and it doesn't work today. So here we are with money dominating our politics. Money politics have driven a wedge between the political system and average people. And we've got an economic system where the middle class is suffering. So the question is, how do we get the middle back? How do we help restore the middle class? And how do we help get the middle back into our politics? Well, I think one of the things we have to do in our politics is we have to start to go to a primary system uh, that, that begins to put everybody in the same voting, all the candidates together, uh, all the voters together, because what that happens is candidates then have to start to appeal to people on both sides of the aisle, to people in the middle, to reach across where they can't get elected. That's being done now in California and in Washington State and some other places. We have to do something, absolutely have to do something about gerrymandering. In this state, uh, I, to, I was giving you national figures, I just had and Larry just checked the, the, the state figures. In 2012, more people voted for Senate candidates, Democratic candidates for the Senate in New Hampshire than voted for Republican candidates. And the, and the Republican uh, now have a 13 to 11 majority in, in the New Hampshire legislature. And it's deadlocked on a number of important issues with the House. Question, if the votes were accurately reflected by the membership in the Senate, according to the votes, would there, be, would there be policy decisions that were being made? I leave that to you as citizens, but at least you need to recognize that gerrymandering is having an effect right here in your state on policy issues that are being decided. And I'm not trying to decide the policy issues for you for a moment this way or that way. I'm simply saying if you want an effective government that can move, it at least has to reflect the voting of, of the people when they go to the polls in November. But beyond that, the changes that we need in Washington in my opinion, raising the, the minimum wage, uh, making the tax laws fair so that American companies that operate in America don't pay a higher tax than companies that make profits overseas, which is the situation now. If General Electric, General Motors, Apple, so forth, they move the, the production overseas, they actually pay a lower effective tax rate. If you want to, we can go through that. We need to do something about research and development. It's a shock and, 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 a, and almost a crime that we have our kids with a trillion dollars of student debt 
and, and we can't raise state support for state institutions. I spoke at UNH last November, and the biggest issue to the kids on the campus is, the, is their own debt. It's their own debt, and it's the, it's the tuition they have to pay, and you can't get the state legislature to, to provide more money to the university system so those kids aren't in debt. What's the argument in the state legislature? If we raise the taxes and we go further into debt, we're passing on debt to the next generation. Hey guys, you're doing it right now. It is happening. Those kids are paying more now and their families are paying more now because we're not stepping up to the plate and solving the question. But I don't think any of those issues are going to get solved unless people like you in this room, like me, get involved. We got to go back to Martin Luther King. We have got to become a new generation of agitators. We got to get to that point where we understand Washington is not going to change itself. The powers that be in Washington, the lobbyists and the people in Congress and lots of other people, the lawyers, all the people who are down there making money, they actually like it the way it is. Talk to them and they'll complain about it to you. They'll have a zillion complaints, but they don't want to change. They like it. It's benefiting them. If you say government doesn't work, you're wrong. You're just on the wrong side. Government is working for the people who are paying to make it work for them. Listen to me. Government is working for the people who are paying for it to work for them. I got a whole section in my book about that. I mean, if you stop and think about it, what I said makes sense. And so what we have to do is decide we want government to go back making work for us. So if we want to honor, if we want to honor this man we're talking about today, Martin Luther King, if we want to honor our own tradition, if we want to rejuvenate our own democracy, we're going to have to do things that empower citizen donations at the average level. We have to do something to give citizens vouchers or citizens matching funds so that the donation for $100 or $200 is worth more. We're going to have to get laws that require disclosure of all campaign spending. We're going to have to do something about rolling back Citizens United. 16 states have done that. 16 states have taken action. There are petitions going around in New Hampshire towns now on the issue of rolling back Citizens United, on public disclosure, on public funding. I want to tell you my friend Kurt Moyer over here, you don't think he's a cameraman alone. He is a dynamo. And he has got petitions going on that he put on the internet through our website, through his own, to encourage people to get involved. You've got to get involved. It starts here. We're fortunate. You're fortunate in Vermont and New Hampshire to have the tradition of town meetings. You can go to a place that's within almost walking distance and sit down in a meeting with people you know and make some collective decisions that matter for American democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is late. We gotta do it now. Thank you. rotten pies and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm happy, and there are a whole bunch of things I left out, and some smart people will notice that and ask really good question, and I hope they're tough, uh, and uh, I look forward to, to a dialogue here. Yes, sir? Why do you think that the powers that be with all the money are going to voluntarily give up their advantage? Why do I think, why do I think the powers that be going to voluntarily? They're not. They're only going to do it if we make them. No, I mean, Frederick Lewis Douglas put it very well. Power never exceeds anything without a demand. We got a demand. Anyway, you got a follow up. The follow up is that uh, all this politics is nice, but there are certain natural forces and like, global warming that are going to overwhelm our attempts at all of our liberal uh, desires. Uh, unless we really change the way people think about the world. That's what I'm here doing tonight. I mean, I'm serious. I think, I think we, you're right. I think we have to actually sit down and engage. Um, I got asked a question earlier today at an earlier session in Manchester. Guy said, well, I like what you're saying, but I'm about to go have lunch with a buddy of mine, and he's on the other side, and he's going to say, what about all the subsidized this, and what is subsidized that? And don't talk to me about Eisenhower, the 92% tax rate that Kennedy said. I said, listen, your friend's entitled to his, his position and his views. He's not entitled to his facts. 
and I think we need to I think we need to stick to that. You know, talking about the government for a moment, which you sort of implied but didn't actually get to. You know, most people are not aware that they're that they're benefiting from some government programs. And let me let me just make clear: I am a strong believer in private enterprise. Okay, but it has excesses and it requires regulation. Um, the tendency of, of, of private enterprise is to amass economic power and get bigger and bigger banks and bigger and bigger uh, uh, companies. And when you get bigger and bigger banks, they need bigger and bigger trillions uh, of derivatives. And then they can't, I mean, even the best bankers within the bank can't follow it, and the regulators can't follow it, and they've gotten so big that they can drive us over the cliff. I see no evidence, no evidence, and I read Gretchen Morganson in the New York Times, and I read everybody I can, you can find, uh, you know, around, and the wisest, smartest economic writers I read say there's no evidence that we fixed the problem that got us into trouble in 2008, 2009. I think, I think we're headed for another cliff if we don't break up the banks. Now, I'm not against banking. I just don't like going over the cliff because somebody else made a bunch of bad decisions, and I don't think that's smart. But at least we need to address those issues. We need to be engaged with that. I mean, the bank lobbyists are down there absolutely dragging their heels, preventing uh, the various regulatory agencies from even issuing the regulations, the so-called voter rule. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't buy the idea that there's anything inevitable going on that prevents us from trying to intelligently address the issues in front of us. Whether it's globalization, technology, global warming, we're sentient, intelligent people. We're, we're a resilient nation. We're a great nation. We've, we've done great things in the past. We're capable of doing great things in the future. But we're on a terrible track. And, and one of the latest polls that I read said 60% of people in America believe America is already in decline. It's a declining civilization. Well, I'm one of those that sits right on the edge. I think we've come up to the tip and we're edging down. And unless we re-energize ourselves and re-engage ourselves, people like us in this room today, intelligent, caring people who are capable of having a dialogue, and we're not going to agree on every issue by a long shot. But we care and we want to do it in an intelligent way and have an intelligent, respectful disagreement and stop having these ultimatums. No, you can't do this. We're going to absolutely end the public school system or whatever. It's beyond the pale. We've got to get back into a range. And we've got to restore the political middle. It won't happen. Yes, ma'am. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, see the same trends uh, globally? How do we stack up in terms of uh, the gap uh, internationally? So glad you asked. Do I see the same trends globally? How do we stack up internationally? Uh, I hear that question asked in a different form from other people. Mr. Smith, aren't you talking about changes that have been forced upon us by globalization, by market forces, by modernizing technology? And my answer is, if that were the case, yes, those have had an impact on us. But if those were the case, we would, in fact, see other little Americas around the world. We don't. Growing inequality of income is going on. In Sweden, it's widened 3%. In Germany, it's widened 4%. I mean, we're, we're off the charts. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Citibank. Citibank in 2005 put out a report to its wealthy in investors and they said invest in companies that cater to the top 1 or 2% in America because there's so much purchasing power in that top 1 or 2%. And then they went on to say that the inequality of income in America today, this is 2005, is the greatest in any major economic power since 16th century Spain. That's 500 years. If you look at something called the Gini coefficient, which is a way economists measure inequality of income. If, you, if Bill Gates owned everything uh, and Warren Buffett owned everything, we would have a score of 1.00. And if everybody was absolutely even, you'd have a score of 0, 0, 0, Okay, So one is extreme inequality, zero is. We have a Gini coefficient of 0.44. It is 50% higher than any other advanced nation. The highest of any other country in the advanced world is about 30.32, and we're 0.44. So we're off the charts relative to other countries. Yes? Uh, the media environment has changed dramatically since your 1970s starting point, and it's much harder to get coverage of organizing efforts. No one to keep it addressed. It's much harder to get coverage 
of, of activities uh, than it was back then. Um, I think there are a lot of things that have happened to the media. I, I don't think we are doing anywhere near as good a job trying to do what I'm trying to do tonight, which is to connect the dots and put pictures together. We are bombarding people with bits and pieces of information that most of us as individuals don't have an, enough ability to put together. And I mean, I think we have an obligation in the media, um, not just in books, but in, in, at least in longer stories, if not in daily stories, to try to explain what's going on. And I think, I think you would find if we did that more, there would be more hooking up with, with the kind of thing you're talking about, which is coverage of, of uh, demonstrations. Um, I don't know your media here in New Hampshire well enough to begin to comment about the coverage here. Um, if you go back to the, say, protests against the Afghan war in places like San Francisco, California, various places around the country, there was quick coverage and then it dropped away. If you go to the coverage of uh, Occupy, uh, the same thing happened. There was intense coverage of Occupy. There was a resonance around the country. And then what happened was the power structure began to do exactly, by the way, it's interesting, very much what the power structure did in the South against the Civil Rights Movement, which is essentially say, you know, they're outside agitators, they're not keeping it clean, they're becoming a public health menace and stuff, and they shifted the issue. Now, part of that was media coverage, Part of that was the shrewdness of people in power, including Mayor Bloomberg in New York. But part of it was also the peculiar, diffuse nature of the leadership and the, uh, the stated goals of Occupy. One thing that was, that was very important to the success of the Civil Rights Movement was the clarity of the leadership on what the objectives were. I never understood, with all the stories I read about Occupy, and I read a lot of stories, maybe not as much as people would have liked, but I read a lot. Um, and it was never clear to me, did they want to break up the big banks? Did they want to put a ceiling on CEO pay? Did they want to impose a tax on stock transactions? And, and, you know, they never articulated the goals, and, and in part they did it because they were trying to be purely democratic. Everybody was equal, so everybody could state their own goals. The result was, there was no clear message. If you're going to have a movement, you have to have leadership and a clarity of message. And that's also necessary with the media. I mean, the Tea Party captured the media. They did, it, whether you like it or not, it was a very effective job I mean, because they just kept drumming away. Smaller government, smaller government, lower taxes, lower taxes, smaller government, lower taxes. And they kept doing it. And then, and then they got a lot of money that came from outside, big money. And they got people uh, who had a lot of political experience uh, in Congress. Dick Army, former majority leader in the New Cambridge, uh, helped them organize, and they went and organized campaigns. So, I, mean, I hate to say it, but if you're going to be smart about the media, you have to be very well organized and very well thought out about how you're going to develop your own political strategy. So I would say you're right. Some of it is the media's fault for not trying to dig deeper. It costs money. It takes time. I spent an entire year without writing a word doing the research for this book, and it took me another year to write the very first draft, and I had to write four more drafts before I got it published. Okay, that takes a lot of time. Newspapers are junking investigative reporters. They're shutting down their environmental teams. Uh, they're reporters who specialize in education, who specialize in health issues, they're being laid off or they're being turned into general reporters who have to cover everything. And when you have general reporters, what happens is they don't have the sources. Somebody comes out with a new drug. Somebody comes out with something on climate change. If you don't have an experienced science reporter, they simply rewrite the press release. You're not finding out anything deep. You're just getting the story that somebody wants you to get. The added value comes from the experience, the connections, the investment. As the news world shrinks, as the profitability of, of news media shrinks, and the staffs and the budgets of news media shrink, you're going to get worse and worse coverage. And we have to decide, we may have to decide at some point whether or not certain elements of the media are of public utility, which need to get maybe different tax treatment or something. We, we have to, may have to decide whether or not that's important enough for American democracy. Uh, and I'm not uncritical of the media. I don't think we've done a very good job on the kind of issues I'm talking about. I've been over here. Let me go over there. Gerrymandering question. I'm a state rep from Exeter, actually, and I see Senator Clark sitting up there. And we've gone through this in New Hampshire where we've seen, and it only happens every 10 years. So, how do we agitate to actually look at that in our state where we've seen the gerrymandering and we've seen the close up 
of Democrats in certain parts of the state in order to preserve the Senate ratio that we have. Um, can you give us some practical well, Yeah, I'm Well, I'm not a lawyer, but there, there are several gerrymandering lawsuits in other states. Virginia, Texas, I know for sure. Uh, I think there's one in North Carolina. Um, there was a whole, uh, if you recall, the, the, the case was Baker versus Carr when the issue was how uh, uh, congressional districts were being drawn on the question of race. Were there minorities that were being deprived? In fact, there's a case in Texas right now in which, in which the, uh, they're saying that the Texas redistricting that occurred in 2010 deprived Latin, uh, Latin Americans of, of two or three seats because the basic increase in population in Texas between uh, 2000 2010, most of it was among Latinos and they came up with the same number of seats. So they're trying on that basis to bring a case that will go to the Supreme Court. I th number one, I think there have to be legal challenges. I don't know enough about the New Hampshire Constitution to begin to step in and say something, whether well, something can be done there. Um, it, I think that, go back and look at the Constitution. I think the Constitution only says that it must be done over every 10 years. It doesn't say it can only be done over 10 years. So if there were a sufficient movement that demanded an interim redrafting I'm not sure that that wouldn't fit under the Constitution. Certainly the federal Constitution. I don't know your Constitution well enough. So I, I think if there was strong public demand for it, you could make the argument that it could be done in between. Texas has already done it. I mean, Texas under Tom DeLay between 2000 and 2010 did a redistricting. And it was not ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court or by any of the federal court system. So I think there are historical precedents that suggest otherwise. Uh, I gotta pay attention to time here. Uh, two more questions. One here and uh, one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, fundamentally, it seems to me that we're not going to be able to accomplish all of the other things that is interesting or agendas that we have if we don't get money out of politics. Mm -hmm. Because that's really influencing all of the voting, all of the decision making, and special interests. As you're moving around the country talking to people, do you see that more and more people are recognizing this and are willing to agitate around that particular um, issue? Because it's so fundamental. Right. This woman, is, I hope you can hear her in the back of the room, she's putting it very well. Um, that, that, that money, money politics has is, is become uh, a dominant problem that, you didn't put it quite this way, in some ways it's everybody's second issue. No matter what other issue you care about, you can't get to that issue because of the importance of money politics. She asserts that and she asks me, as you go around the country, do you find that lots of people are concerned about this issue and they're ready to agitate? I find everywhere I go, everywhere I go, and I spoke to a group of the top 1%, if not the top 0.1% um, in Florida, in Stewart, Florida. I don't believe there was a couple in the room that had um, net worth under $100 million, okay? And even they are concerned about it, if they're honest. Do you see leadership? Now, do I see leadership? What's your name? I'm Okay, you're it. You're the leader. <laughs> I stumbled into what I just said. Because I get that question everywhere too. And it happened to me in a senior home in Seattle. And I, in the first place I was astonished. Uh, it was two o'clock in the afternoon. I figured most people there would be taking a nap, right? <laughs> and so there were 25 or 30 people there, 150 people there. I went to something like this without the Martin Luther King thing because it wasn't that day. And people were just bombarding me with questions. It was wonderful, the engagement of the people there. And a gentleman got up, sitting back about where that man is next to the, 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 the camera. And he said exactly the same thing. Where is the Martin Luther King? When is he going to appear? And I said, what's your name? And he said, Ben. I said, Ben, you're it. And if I were you, I would hook up with the person who organized this event, Liz Brett. Because she's a really good organizer. She's your co-chairman. My wife, wait a minute. i got to finish this. This is really funny. But my wife and I then went and spent 45 minutes with our friends, the Bretts. We were leaving the building. We were going down to the ground floor to pick up our car. And lo and behold, Ben is in the lobby 
And he comes over to me with a clipboard and he says, I got 15 names all over. <laughs> I have two bills in the legislature. Both of them are addressing the issue of Citizens United. But we cannot get them passed in the Senate if you don't lean on the Republican senators to change their vote. So I'm trying to provide that leadership, but what I'm saying is that if I don't have the support of the communities to reach out to the people um, that are going to vote on this, we're not going to be able to move forward. And let me just say, Senator, uh, I gather you're a Democrat. <laughs> All, all, I, all I'm saying is that wherever I go, rank and file independents and Republicans feel the same way. So there's some kind of disconnect here. And that's one of the reasons, I'm not saying this for partisan reasons, but that's one of the reasons why I'm saying things are not going to change unless we in this room do something about it. And I didn't realize you were a sitting official, but if it had been the gentleman next to you or the woman behind you, I would have said the same thing. Because it isn't, well, okay. But it, it, isn't, it isn't because you're sitting in the legislature I said that. I didn't know that, okay? It's because you asked the question. And the, que the leadership question has to be answered by the people who ask the leadership question. I, my point about meeting Martin Luther King lying on the ground was that he wasn't the guy who delivered the speech at the Washington, uh, uh, March on Washington at that point. He was three years before that. He was getting there. But he wasn't recognized that way. In fact, he was an outside agitator. He was being denounced all across the South. He was a pariah. J. Edgar Hoover was bugging his phone. So it wasn't all good news. Was, a motel was being bombed. We have this picture that leaders somehow leap onto white horses, you know, from childbirth or something like that. It doesn't happen. We have to grow it from the bottom up. You know that. I shouldn't be saying this to you of all people. Citizen. You're right. We have to have an outraged citizen. And last question. You had a question before. Anybody? There was somebody. Else. Yes, ma'am, over there. You. Oh. The <laughs> Everyone's talking about the ad against Senator Shaheen about the um, affordable care. Now, and, we have, talking about the ad against uh, Senator Shaheen for? Against um, what, what she said about the, 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 supporting, about the um, supporting the Affordable Care Act. Now, that has people's attention. And it gives a number to call, call your congressman, this is the number, tell her this. Why don't we have some ads out? Because some people don't have computers. Why isn't on TV with people watching it? Okay. I know one of you that. Yeah, well, um, I, I, forgive me. I, I, I'm, I'm a guy who tries to answer every question, but I, I simply don't know enough facts about what's going on on this issue here in your state to, to make it, give you an intelligent answer. I, I don't know the answer. Let me just ask, ask, is there one last generic question that we have to stop? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, it's got to be quick. Okay. Uh, to my mind, the problem is a systemic one, and it goes back to the Constitutional Convention when uh, they were deciding in Article 1 how many uh, citizens uh, a representative should represent in the House of Representatives. They said 30,000, and it's right there still in the Constitution. Uh, they thought 40,000 was too high, if you read Madison's uh, record of this. Now we have 700,000 as the average uh, constituency of a representative. So we have less than 4% of the representation in government than, that, than what was intended for us. Can we at some point talk about systemic reform, constitutional reform to yeah. address some of the Yeah, I think we could, but if we took your ratios, we'd have 20 times as many people in, in the Congress. Can you imagine the House of Representatives operating better with 8,700 members? Yes. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I got to beg off on that one. Anyway, thank you. I'll sign some books up here.